caution. The AJ and Quill show contains D&D content and is intended for a D&D audience. And, besides that, they're really weird. Hi everyone, welcome to Meta Jason, your stop for monster tactics in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. I'm Professor AJ, and with me as always is my fearless companion, Quill the Dragon. Say hi, Quill. Greetings, puny humans. Prepare to absorb the knowledge Quill will dispense with his mighty jaws. Speaking of which, what are we covering today? Today we're covering one of my all-time favorite monsters, the Orum Vorax. There's a mouthful. But let's not waste any more time. You got questions, we got answers. Let's get dangerous. You can find stats for the Forum Vorax inside the Journey to the Radiant Citadel book. Now let's see what the book says. Forum Voraxes. An Orum Vorax is an eight-legged, badger-like creature. These aggressive omnivores attack any prey they think that they can best, ambushing even creatures double their size. They supplement their diets with metal, whether it's worked or ore, and they have a particular taste for gold. This diet lends an Ormvorax's fur its golden sheen. Alone or in small groups, Ormvoraxes dig deep in search of precious metals. Such explorations often lead them into conflicts with subterranean settlements. As defenders of such communities often wear metal armor, Ormvoraxes prioritize attacking armored foes whether the armor is metal or not. Now there's not a lot of information there, but that's still pretty cool. The book has two kinds of Orum Voraxes for you to use. Now first, the Orum Vorax. Early in its life, Orum Voraxes cooperate with their siblings and their den leader parents, digging tunnels in search of metal and other burrowing prey. As they grow into adulthood, Orum Voraxes hunt on their own, carving out territories they viciously defend. And there's also a den leader. Now for them, an Orm Vorax that feeds on a steady supply of precious metals gradually grow in size over their whole life. These Orm Voraxes are faster and deadlier than others of their kind. And when you look at their stats, they're actually a little bit bigger too. Let's check out their stats. Now before we do that, we will say that for the purposes of making this a lot easier on everyone, we want you to take the Orum Vorax Den Leader and think of that as the adult Orum Vorax. And the regular Orum Vorax you can think of as the kittens. Now we say kittens because Orum Vorax young are referred to as kittens. But let's look at the den leader first. Now the Orum Vorax den leader, or the adult version of the Orum Vorax, is a CR4 medium monstrosity and it's unaligned typically. They have an AC of 16, which is like wearing plate armor all the time, 8d6 hit points, with a speed of 40 feet and a burrowing speed of 20 feet. Now they touch more on the burrowing speed in a bit. Now it's got some pretty solid stats with strength, con, and dex being its highest. It has proficiency in the strength and con saving throws, proficiency with perception and stealth, which is what you would typically find on an ambush predator. And they're immune to the petrified condition. They have dark vision out to 60 feet and a passive perception of 13. Now the adult Orum Vorax has the pack leader trait. The Orum Vorax allies have advantage on attack rolls while they're within 10 feet of the Orum Vorax, provided that it isn't incapacitated. They also have the tunneler feet. The Orum Vorax can burrow straight through solid rock and metal at half of its burrowing speed, leaving a five foot diameter tunnel in its wake. For attacks, it has a multi-attack where it can bite or use one of its many claws. And they have eight claws, so it's a lot. Now, when you look at the lore, the way these things used to work in 2nd edition is they would run up and they would bite onto a creature. And once they bit onto it, you couldn't make them let go. And they would just sit there and grab onto you and rake you with all of their metal claws over and over again until they died. These creatures are relentless. Now, for the claw attack, if the target is a large or smaller creature, that target is now grappled by the Orm Vorax with an escape DC of 14. Now, until the grapple ends, the Orm Vorax can't use its claws against any other target, and when it moves, it can drag the grappled creature with it without having its speed reduced. Now, usually if you're grappling a creature and you try to move them, your speed is cut in half. The Orm Vorax doesn't suffer that. But the bite is where it gets interesting. Right. If an Orm Vorax bites a creature that is wearing armor, 
it gains one of the following benefits. Invigorate, where the Ormvorix regains 1d8 plus 2 hit points. And Frenzy, the Ormvorix has advantage on attack rolls until the start of its next turn. Similar to a barbarian. Now the Ormvorix can only activate these extra things if it attacks somebody with armor. This is why it prioritizes targets that are wearing armor. Now as a note, it did say that armor doesn't have to be metal armor. Any armor will do. If you look at the Orm Vorex Kittens, they're basically the same, only a little bit weaker, with lesser stats. And for the purpose of this video, we're only going to cover combat tactics for the adult Orm Vorex, or the Den Leader, because the tactics between the two really isn't going to change all that much. Now I've been waiting for these creatures for a while, they were one of the first creatures I ever killed in any Dungeons and Dragons game, ever. But what isn't the book telling you? Now Orm Vorex is a pretty nifty name. Although it's weird to say. Yeah, I know. It comes from Latin. See, Aurum in Latin means gold, and Vorax means somebody who is voracious. So it's something that would gorge on a whole bunch of gold. Hence the nickname, Golden Gorger. But they don't just eat gold, they're also carnivores. They eat meat. Now when we looked at their stats, we showed you that they have proficiency in perception and stealth. Now these two skill proficiencies together are very typical of an ambush predator, like a hunting cat. Or a spider. And if the Orum Vorex is looking for food or it's hunting prey to eat, then it will use ambush tactics. But it's unlikely that player characters are going to be ambushed or hunted by an Orum Vorex. They're too big and they're not really tasty. So the only time they're really going to encounter this creature is if they happen upon its den, or if they have to protect the gold supply from the Orm Vorexes eating it. Now Orm Vorexes are heavy. Really heavy. Like 500 pounds for a one meter long creature. And these giant golden weasel badgers have eight legs. They're like a wolverine. Uh, no, not that wolverine. That wolverine. It's because they're tough, aggressive, and have metal bones. And like our friend James Howlett, they're very heavy. Right, about 500 pounds worth of heavy. It's because they're so dense. Now they are carnivores, but they need to supplement their diet with a whole bunch of precious metals. Like how humans need to have iron in their diets, only to a much more extreme amount. This means that an Ormvorex are typically going to live in areas where there's lots of precious metals. It also means they might venture into areas where there are precious metals, like a castle's treasury or a dwarven mine. Now they need these precious metals both for their own biological functions and because they're kittens. That's right. Their babies are called kittens. Right, so like the young Orum Voraxes, they need that metal to survive. If they don't get it, they'll actually die. Now a kitten would die if it doesn't receive any gold. But, if they receive platinum, it could extend their life by a few weeks. Now it's the gold in their diet that gives their fur its golden sheen. Same as the copper in their claws. Right, or how the males have a mane that's kind of brassy. And their bones are made from a metal alloy that also comes from their diet. Now, we were saying that their fur and their bones and their teeth and all that is made of metal, but it's kind of not. It's actually a metal alloy that's quite a bit stronger than most metals. Think of it more like a steel. Now an Ormvorex is a solitary creature, except when it wants to mate and have young. This happens about once every eight or nine years. Now the young, which are called kittens, usually come about in litters of around six. And for the first two weeks, they're completely hairless and have their eyes closed. Now if you manage to get one of these kittens before its eyes open, they're actually quite valuable because an Ormvorex is nearly impossible to train after its eyes open. But if you catch it before, they can be trained as they will imprint on whoever it sees first. Right, but to do so you have to feed them lots and lots of gold and give them lots of love and affection. Otherwise it doesn't work. Now because they eat so much gold and precious metals, dwarves tend to not like Orm Vorex's one bit. Although they can be very useful, or at least parts of them can. The golden hide of an Orm Vorex is actually quite valuable and can fetch around $3,000 on the open market. This pelt can be used to even make armor that's as effective as plate mail, although it also weighs as much as plate mail. And some gnome paladins were even known to ride celestial Orum Voraxes into combat as their mounts. And their hide is also really valuable to both dwarves and gnomes because they use it in the making of wedding dresses and funeral clothes. 
particularly burial garments. Same as the claws, the teeth, and the bones are all used in making very expensive jewelry. And the eyes of an Orm Vorax were said to be key components in magic items that could see into the future. Now if you had one of these pelts, you could sell it for about 3,000 gold pieces. On top of that, you could take the leftover carcass without the hide and burn it in a forge and get gold. Right, although this was really special. You had to burn it with special alchemical items, and the burning process took a few weeks inside the forge to get anything out of it. Now some species of Orum Vorex are obligate hibernators. This means they sleep through the winter months. Although the cool thing is, typically an Orum Vorex breathes through its mouth and nose, like every other mammal. But when they're hibernating, they breathe through their skin. It's also a function they would use to breathe when they were burrowing deep underground. Now an Orum Vorex can grow to a monstrous size. Right, they grow their whole lives, and as long as they have a steady supply of precious metals, they just keep growing. There's rumored to be an Orm Vorex the size of a dragon inside the marching mountains of the Forgotten Realms. Now, this is all really cool, and I like the stats, but what does this all mean? How do they behave in combat? Well, first things first, looking at their stats, you can clearly see that this is a tank. They're brute creatures. Their primary offensive ability is strength. And their primary defensive ability is constitution. Now, we say constitution even though their dexterity and their con are the exact same number. The reason is these creatures read as being more tough and willing to absorb damage than nimbly in trying to avoid damage. And since they'd rather absorb damage with their tough hide and dense bodies, we say they're much more like tanks. Right, or a brute, or a frontliner, that kind of a creature. And since they have a really high natural armor class from that hide, and a ton of hit points, it just makes more sense. Now, at the start of an Orm Vorex's turn, if any creature it considers hostile or a threat is within 40 feet of it, or any one of its kittens, it's going to attack. It will use its whole 40 feet of movement to charge the creature and unleash its multi-attack. Now, once it gets within melee range, it's going to use its multi-attack. But to do this, it's going to use its bite attack first. It did this in the second edition lore, and it just makes sense. Right, this is because its bite does extra stuff. Now, because of the extra things that its bite can do, an Ormvarks is going to prioritize armored opponents. But that can be leather armor, it can be metal armor, any of that stuff. Although, keep in mind that magical armor, or natural armor, doesn't work for this. Right, so like, attacking a turtle with its natural armor wouldn't make a difference, but attacking a rogue wearing leather armor would. Now, when it bites an armored opponent, it can do one of two things. It can either gain hit points back, or it can go into a frenzy. This means it will have to think about when it will do each. Right, so to make this simple, we're going to make a standing decision. Before an Aurum Vorex becomes bloodied, this means before it's at half hit points. Right, that's a term that comes from 4th edition. So before it's at half its hit points, an Orm Vorex will use Invigorate if it bites a creature wearing armor. This will regain it some hit points, and it'll keep the fight going. And before this point, if whatever it's attacking decides to run away, the Orm Vorex won't chase it. After the Orm Vorex has become bloodied, it will only frenzy. Right, now you've pissed it off enough that it's just going to go in complete berserker rage. I would like to rage. Now from this point on, an Orm Vorex will not retreat, it will not suffer a morale failure, and it's going to keep attacking you until it's dead. So when it bites a creature that has armor after this point, it will only use its frenzy to gain advantage on its attacks. Right, that's why we say it's going to use its bite first, because then the rest of its multi-attack, its two claw attacks, will all be at advantage. Now, if it hits with its claw attack, that creature's automatically grappled, and the Orm Vorex can drag that creature away wherever it wants without losing any of its speed. So we're going to say once it bites a creature, if it can, it's also going to pull that creature away from combat every round using its full movement. Right, if it can, it's going to drag it down one of its own holes or into a corner or away from its allies to separate that creature so it can kill it. Now, as a special note, we are going to say if you encounter these in a group, it's going to be a family group. So there'll be den leaders and there'll be Orm Vorexes, so adults and kittens. If anybody ever attacks one of the kittens or they kill one of them, then the Orm Vorex adult is going to automatically frenzy for the rest of the combat. Like a mama bear they don't put up when you mess with their kids. And that's basically it. These aren't complicated combatants. 
they're going to run into melee combat, they're going to attack the closest creature they can find wearing armor, and they're going to keep hitting them until either the creature runs away or they're dead. And once they become bloodied, or if you attack one of their kittens, then they instantly frenzy, and they won't give up. Right, and aside from having to pick between when to use Invigorate or when to use their frenzy, they're not super complicated. Now, if you want tactics for the Orm Vorax kittens, it's identical to what we just said. Right, the only difference is they're slightly weaker, and they don't really get a choice on what happens when they bite a creature that is wearing armor. They only regain hit points. They can't frenzy. Although when you encounter them together, the kittens will stay within 10 feet of the Orm Vorax. Now this is because of their pack leader trait. Now doing this will provide all the Orm Vorax's allies, meaning its kittens, with advantage on all their attack rolls. Although this doesn't apply to the Orm Vorax den leader itself, but it can gain advantage if it wants to, just by frenzying. Right, and the likelihood of this happening when all the kittens are in combat with it is pretty high, because somebody's probably going to smack a kitten somewhere. You monsters. And that's it. We hope you have fun using these awesome creatures. They have kind of a really cool history throughout Dungeons and & Dragons, and most people have either seen or had to fight one, and they're nostalgic for a lot of us who played back in 2nd edition. Till next time. Keep rolling those dice. We hope you have a good one. Bye. Run.